All right, breaking in the new shop. Very first car, second car actually, but. First one was a 2007 Kia with rusted brake lines and worn brakes. That is crazy to want to do that kind of stuff. Um, 2015 Bentley Continental Flying Spur with busted air suspension. You may have seen my video short a few weeks ago about uh, looking at it over in Ralph's, Ralph's place, but uh, the right front strut is leaking. There's videos out there on how to do the strut. So what I hope to achieve in this video is to teach you a few of the things that, uh, that would help you perform your own repairs on your own air suspension car, no matter what kind of car it is. So whether it be a Mercedes, a uh, Porsche, an Audi, a Bentley, a GM model, um, a Tesla, air suspension all pretty much works similar fashion. There's a compressor, there's a relay to actuate the compressor, there's a fuse to protect the compressor. There is fuses for the module. The module is gonna read in level sensors to tell where the level of the car is at. And that's how it knows if it's lower or higher. So we'll find the level sensor on here. So I'll show you kind of how some of them hook up or whatnot. Um, some air struts come with electrical connections, some don't. Uh, that just kind of tells you uh, the function of the strut, whether it has adaptable suspension, or you can change the settings in the suspension to make it firmer or softer. Some struts have the valve in the strut to let air in and out. Other ones utilize the valve block. So there are cars that are out there that have a valve block that lets air to the strut, but then the strut lets air inside of itself. Or other ones, the valve block, once it lets air to the strut, the, air, the strut is raising or lowering depending on if it's opening or closing uh, the pressure relief valve. So. Um, very simple. Don't ever get intimidated by something. The only time you get intimidated is when you don't know. So if you come across a car that you're not sure how the air suspension works, you're gonna wanna Google and find an actual document from the manufacturer that shows how it works. I don't want you to Google and find Jim's forum and what Jim tells you how it works. I don't even want you to believe how I tell you how it works. I want you to see it on a piece of paper that tells you how it works. I will try to find myself how the Bentley system works and attach it to the video somewhere. I hope I remember and I hope I do that. But, uh, so I'm gonna get at it. So the first thing you should do with any air suspension system is, want to find out uh, how to deactivate it if you got to raise it in the air in the Bentley what you have to do is turn the ignition on okay the compressor kicked on but you press and hold the shock button and the raise button for five seconds and as you hold it you'll see the suspension light come on the dash and the compressor just shut off so now the air suspension is deactivated all right, and if you need to know how to do that kind of stuff for your model, whatever air suspension you're using, read the owner's manual. I went ahead and saved the page. So let's open it up to the page. It's always under the section of jacking the car. This one tells you how to disengage. Let me take the key out. How to disable the air suspension. Now, in some cars, like the Mercedes, when you raise the car in the air, it uh, automatically cancels self-leveling. Some cars, like Mercedes, are smart enough to know that, um, and I didn't mean it that way. Some cars, like Mercedes, are designed so when the level sensors read a certain level, the uh, air suspension module knows that the car is raised, so it locks out function. So if you're trying to... If you just fix the Mercedes air system and you're trying to get the air to be put into the shocks and struts, it's not gonna be if the car's in the air. It has to be on the ground with the weight on the wheels. So I'm gonna go ahead and rip this wheel off and uh, get to the shock and see what other things we can figure out with this thing. So right now the compressor's pumping, it's pushing in air and I can hear it escaping. 
from the top of the strut. So, pretty sure the strut's leaking. Pull it out and see if I can test it that way. See what happens when I lower it down. All right. Unfortunately, in most videos, you do not see people using fender covers. I am a big purveyor of keeping the car protected. Uh, there's a well-known YouTuber that I like to watch myself, but I see he has a big bundle of keys strapped to his belt loop. That is a no-no. If you come into my shop and I see you wearing keys or a belt that can scratch a car, uh, you're going to get my wrath because nothing is more important than taking care of the customer's car, even your own car. There's no place for belts that'll scratch. There's no place for keys hanging, uh, pocket screwdrivers. Try to keep everything away from you. You don't wear jewelry, uh, no necklaces, no rings, no ties, no long hair, you know, that can get caught in stuff. Uh, there's a lot of things you got to worry, not only for safety of yourself, but safety of the car, man. You know, you got to take care of these people's cars better than you would your own. Uh, so that's one thing that uh, I try to preach a lot is if you open the hood on the car, protect everything around it. Um, I only have one fender cover. I'm only going to be working in one area today. But if anyone's ever worked with me, uh, they will see that I wrap up the whole front end. I don't want anything dropping on a fender, scratching a fender. Uh, nothing is worse than bringing your car to a shop. And then you leave the shop and weeks later you find something and you're like, you know that was part of the repair, but they didn't do a correct walk around before they took the car into service and they didn't give you another walk around when they dropped the car back off to make sure things were okay. So... That's one thing that I want you guys to focus on with your own cars is always protect your car. I use these little clamps that you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot for, they used to be like 30 cents, but now they're like 60 cents. Um, I got a whole, I got a whole jar full of them. I'll show you. Got them right over here. I keep all these. I got about 10 or 11 of them, which gives me enough to wrap around the whole front of any car. So <clears throat> first thing we're gonna do is uh, when cars have a wheel lock key, you do not ever want to use an impact tool on a wheel lock key. So I always break them free by hand. So I'm going to break this first one free on the ground. And since it's already on the ground, I'll just crack the rest of them loose and then I'll zip the wheel off. Um, you got to be careful with these because once you break them, it's a pain in the butt uh, getting a hold of the right one because there's a code for each of these. All the dealers have their own master key lock set that uh, you can't really look at them up at, by VIN. Um, you got to figure out which one that is. So we just take them out of the kit one by one, see whichever fits, and then we order that one again for the customer. So I'm going to get after this wheel. All right, so these are 17 millimeter. One of my favorite ratchets is a Matco. I believe it's uh, almost two, let me see, 24 inches. Yep, 24 inches long, flexible locking head. If you're ever gonna buy a ratchet, buy the flexible locking heads because it becomes a straight ratchet and you always have the option to unlock it. Nothing's worse than spending high dollar on a non-unlocking one and then you come to a point where you would love to have one that flex. So I opted for this one. The part number is Charlie Frank Roger 24 Lima Frank Thomas. And I actually bought this off eBay. Um, I'm not a purveyor of buying tools off the truck uh, not that I don't feel they're worth it, but sometimes I don't feel that they're worth it. So what you'll see some people do as well when they try to break wheels loose is they go this way, pushing down. I never push down. Uh, I don't want to fall. I don't want to hit my hand against the ground. So I always loosen it standing up because you have a little bit more force when you're squatting and pulling up to break it free. And now it's free. And then you do a star pattern to relax the wheel. So it comes out, comes loose evenly. And I also like doing this by hand because of the aluminum rims. You don't want your impact gun zipping around and scratching up all the aluminum. If you look at any one of your wheels, you'll see marks somewhere from some knucklehead that just zipped them out and the lug bolt and everything spun around and shoot up the aluminum. So. Now they'll free, I'll get the wheel off. I also have the wood down here because I needed it. This car's so low, I had to get the extra clearance to put the rack underneath it. That's why you see wood. And because the bumper is so low, I had to make sure the wood was more so towards the outside of the wheel. 
<clears throat> or else the bumper was just pushing the wood, so I couldn't even get up on the rack. But uh, yeah, get the wheel off. One of the things I always see guys do at the shop is uh, they fight the wheels off. Um, let me move this back some here so you get a better view. All right. So when you're dealing with the, uh, you guys want to see me? I don't know about that. When you're dealing with like a German car or anything that uses a lug bolt, not a lug nut. So there's the bolt, right? That holds it in. So once you loosen these, nothing holds it on. And every time I see different ways of people trying to keep it on there, I just use one finger. And I'm doing this live, so if it messes up, it messes up. But uh, so I unscrew them all. I leave. I leave the bottom one last. Okay. So I take the top one out. Unscrew them all by hand. Now all that I've ever seen and taken off because of the hub, the hub bearing. There's a lip that the, that the rim sits on. So all I do is I hold the bottom because the first thing the wheel's gonna wanna do is it's gonna wanna do this. It's gonna wanna fall in, which it slams out and hits the brake dust shield. And normally the brake dust shield will bend and hit the rotor. And then you got a squeak noise as you drive around. So all I do is I leave the bottom one in last and see, it's already kinda falling this way. You just gotta hold it on there. You're just gonna hold the weight on the hub, all right? Now it's off. Now it's just hanging out there. So I'm gonna just drop that. And how I take off a wheel is I hold the bottom and then I grab the top and I carry it down. You don't have to hug it. You don't have to fight it off. So right now, if I let it go, the whole thing's gonna rock that way. So I just grab it and I pull it off. No damage, nothing was done. I didn't hug the wheel. There's not brake dust and anti season and all kinds of stuff all over me. If you've watched my videos before, someone commented, I don't get dirty. I do not like getting dirty. Do I think there's something wrong with that? Yes and no. What happened to me was uh, I was the guy. I was arms full of brake dust and dirt and everything. The first dealership I worked at, we had white shirts. White shirts they gave us because they wanted us to look very professional in a white shirt. So you spent more time making sure you didn't get dirt on you, right? On top of that, when you work on cars that exceed $200,000 in value, do you think the customer wants to come into the shop and see a dirty, greasy guy jumping in and out of their car? They don't. I wear gloves, you only get one skin, right? Like uh, oils and stuff are shown to cause cancer and all that stuff. I just, I wanna live a long, healthy life, right? So I try not to breathe in, break dust and stuff. I wear masks, I wear goggles. I wear uh, aprons. If I do a trans service, I'll wear a cooking apron so I don't get all the grease and oil dripping everywhere on my clothes. Uh, do I look silly? Yeah. Do I care? No. It's made me very successful in my time. And it just, when a customer walks in, I rip off the glove and I can shake their hand nice and clean. I, I can work on an engine or transmission all day long and stay just as clean as I am right now. Um, do I think there's anything wrong with being dirty? You know what? If, if that's you, that's you. I don't, that's fine. It's cool, right? But you gotta imagine how many times have you taken your car for an oil change or had someone work on it, you get in it and there's grease on the steering wheel or you can see the handprint. I brought my van, I got a Dodge Caravan, I brought it in for a recall and uh, they did the recall, no big deal. I get it back and there's a handprint on the pillar like the guy dragged into the car and then I can feel on the leather steering wheel his handprint full of grease. I, so I wiped it with a baby wipe and like, what do you say? Now I'm gonna go back in there and complain? I already cleaned it up. I just Next time I go in, I'll, I'll just say, hey, if you do work on my car, make sure the guy's clean. I, you know, little things like that. It all adds up to me. In the eyes of the customer, you're that much more professional, you know. Um, they feel more comfortable letting you work on their car, right? So it was just something that came to me over time. I didn't wake up one day and be like, I don't want to get dirty. It just, over time, I just obsessed about it. And then I learned ways around getting dirty. In fact, if I'm going to work on the air strut and everything, I'm gonna grab another fender cover or rags or whatever I got. And I'm gonna cover the rotor. That way I'm not getting brake dust all in my arms. I'm not scratching up myself in anything and I'm not gonna damage the rotor. You know what I mean? I constantly cover up whatever I don't want to damage or, or have affected by whatever work I'm gonna do. 
So these are tips that you can use in your own workings and you'll see it takes a couple extra seconds to do the things that I do, but in the end, you save yourself time and hassle from stuff getting damaged, stuff getting lost. Um, if you've ever worked around anices, it finds its way everywhere. You'll get a little silver glob on a wrist or a glove and next thing you know, it's on every tool you own, it's in the car, it's on the seat, it's on the TV remote, it's just, you know, it's just everywhere. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and figure out what I gotta take out next and go from there. All right, so here's the level sensor. The level sensor is attached to the lower control arm or lower spring link. They got a bunch of different names. I'm not sure what Bentley calls them, all right? So it's connected to the lower control arm. And I can tell you that you can imagine, all right, that when the car lowers, this arm is actually gonna go up, right? Because the car is gonna sink down, so this arm's gonna go up, which is gonna push the level sensor bracket or the arm, it's gonna rotate it this way, which is gonna send the signal of the sensor. It's gonna show a voltage that the module is not gonna like. So the module is gonna activate the compressor to fill this strut so this arm will go down until it's happy with the voltage and then it'll cut it out. Now I don't have any documentation to prove that. I'm just going off of experience with other air suspension cars. So when you're working around something like this, you wanna be sure that if you take the linkage off, it goes right back on where you took it off and the arm is facing the exact same direction it was. You don't want to disturb it because you can actually trick it. If you've ever seen those adjustable links, if I adjust this link and make this higher, it will change the reading, which will make the air compressor either raise or lower or air suspension module raise or lower the suspension to match the voltage that I want. So if you've ever seen those uh, lowering links on eBay, <clears throat> you can buy them and adjust them. All you're doing is tricking the module because the module wants to see a certain voltage so you just adjust it until where you want it so but uh looks like we just got to take out nut and a bolt here bolt there knock these arms out these bolts are up top again there's videos on how to do this so i'm not going to record how i take this out but uh, when i do get it out i'll show you some other things that i would pay attention to um from my experience so All right, another thing I do, uh, which I'm not sure, a lot of times you don't know until you know, and then once you know, you know. Brass hammers, okay? They're super soft, and they don't mess up threads. You can use these to hit out bolts that are hard to get out, all right? However, I still don't hit them with the brass hammer. I lay the hammer against the threads, and then I hit another hammer on top of it, okay? That way it's extra, extra safe, because even though brass is soft it's still a thread and enough force will make that thread move right so just as easy as that it's easy to pop that out so uh, you can find these at harbor freight which is like the man's version of target uh pretty cheap a couple bucks um they make many different shapes and sizes but they even have uh brass punches so yeah brass hammer another hammer so i got the shock out and it's actually leaking air through I can figure out my camera stuff here. Right here. Right there. What can I do about that? Absolutely nothing. I fill it up and air just squeaks right out of there. It's not even leaking. It sounded like it was coming from up here, but it wasn't. I just put air through here, and that's where it starts coming out. Um, one way you can check it is I'm just use an air gun here. Let's see if it'll do it right here. Right there. Ain't that a shame? Fifteen hundred dollars for a strut. Unless I can find it cheaper. And all that's bad is a little rubber seal. Ain't that crazy. So I know there's other videos that show how to remove a strut, but since I'm here, I might as well show you. Um, all I did was undo the airline. Okay, 10 millimeter wrench. All right, I undid the bolts. 
There's 16 millimeter bolt with a 16 millimeter nut. Another 16 millimeter bolt with a, we'll call it a cat, or, or nut with a uh, index bolt. That's the one I use the brass hammer on. All right, and then there's three, they call them tri-squares that are up at the top that hold the top of the strut mount on. Get those in the engine bay, all right. These are the upper, maybe camber caster bolt rods, you know, uh, cross struts, spring links, all kinds of different names we have for these. Not sure what uh, Bentley or Volkswagen calls them. And then four nuts, 13 millimeter to take that off. One electrical connection in the engine bay. So ultimately very simple, very easy. Oh, one 18 millimeter bolt and nut with a damper at the bottom. All right, that went through there. So I did undid the bottom first uh, to let the shock off the control arm right here. And then I undid these bolts so it can all come down. Then I went to the top and I undid the bolts in the engine bay, which allowed the strut to come down and I was able to snake it out this way. Super easy, super easy. The only thing you have to remember is to uh, shut off the air suspension. Uh, make sure if you have the car up in the air, you use jack stands. Do not trust a hydraulic jack to hold the car up. Please always use jack stands or blocks of wood, something to keep the car from falling on you. I have the luxury at the moment of using the rack. So I have it on the rack, but anytime you get it up in the air with the rack, you still have to be sure that if I'm gonna lower it, I'm not hitting the wheels on the ground, you know, to knock the car off the rack. So uh, always exercise precaution at all times. Now the tricky part with the air suspension is even though I know the strut is leaking and I know the compressor does try to fill it up, there's a chance that when I put a new strut in there, the compressor is now weak and worn out from all the times it tried to fill that strut. So <clears throat> as a technician, you always have to say that I'm never gonna tell somebody the strut's gonna fix it. I'm gonna tell you I have to replace the strut and then I gotta run the car, drive the car, and check it again to verify it's all good before I give it back to the customer. Because there's a possibility that the, the valve block is now worn out and or the air compressor. So same thing with the relay. If the relay is always clicking on and off, uh, the car only has 10,000 miles for a 2015. So I'm not gonna worry about doing both struts. The only time you would wanna do both struts is if you're over 30 to 40,000 miles difference in a new strut to an old strut because it still is a shock inside there and the shock can wear so you can have uneven, an uneven ride or premature failure of the opposite side when now you have a new side because the weakest link is always gonna fail. So that's where I'm at. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get this ordered. And uh, when it comes in, not that you would know, but I'll finish the job and the video will be completed then. So as of right now, it is December 31st. So um, I won't be able to fix this car until next year. Yeah, that's, I'm sure that joke's been going on a lot. So happy 2022 to all of you. I wish for you nothing but the best. I wish nothing but love and happiness in your lives. And I hope that I bring some benefit to you guys. So um, I will continue this video when the part comes in. All right, so we got the new struts. And what I should have done is brought the old one to the parts store to compare. So before you replace anything, you always want to make sure that you match up whatever you got. The new one I actually got from O'Reilly's, made by Dorman. However, it's got the same company logo on it. Shows VW Audi because it's the same as a Phaeton. So uh, let's hope this is nice and good but you always want to match them up before you spend time putting them in so we got threads threads the bolts seem to match up for the top we got a wire here's be the same connection same style uh, looks so so good so far so good so what I did was, uh, do this. Um, 
O'Reilly's didn't have a Bentley option. So I went on the Arnott website, arnottindustries.com, and looked up the, the strut number. It gave me the part number. I called my friend at O'Reilly's. I gave him the part number, and he was able to find it. So even though you can't find it by the year, make and model, sometimes you give them the part number, they can cross-reference it. And I think the strut cost uh, 750 bucks compared to um, some $1,500 from the dealer. And it's the dealer strut just filtered through a couple different distributors. So we're gonna go ahead and get it installed now. All right, so I'm about to remount the wheel. And another tip and trick is anytime you have an aluminum wheel and a cast iron hub, a little ring of anti-seize on there. That helps it from sticking and corroding and giving you issues taking the wheel off. So now you've seen how I took it off nice and easy, how I feel. I have a method to put big wheels and tires back on, especially when you're dealing with bolts. That way you ain't gotta fight it. Just locate the upper one straight up and down. Have your bolt and socket ready somewhere. Okay. I stand the wheel up, and then what I do is I roll it onto my hand. So I'll start from afar, and I'll use the inside of my thigh, and I'll roll it up. Then when you put the hole straight up, again, one finger holds it on. Now I can locate the hole, put the bolt in, you can do it the top or bottom. You do the bottom because it, like I said, it wants to tilt in. And once you get started, that's it. You're not fighting the wheel, you're not hugging the wheel, you're not dropping the wheel, you're not slamming into the rotor. You're not trying to figure out where all the bolts are at. You're not trying to hold it from the center. The worst spot is trying to hold it from the center because all the weight is trying to tip it. So again, just put a little pressure down here and it stops everything from falling. So I'll get these, uh, I'm gonna get these all set. And because I have the wheel lock, we're gonna torque the wheel lock last, but I'll get these all set from the star pattern. So it sinks the wheel down evenly. I'll just hand tighten with a ratchet and then when I get on the ground, I'll use my torque wrench to torque them down, so. All right, got her done. Moment of truth, let's go and remove the uh, jacking mode, I guess, if you want to call it that. Let's get in here. <clears throat> going to do is we're going to go ahead and turn the key on and then press and hold the raise and lower button and the shock button okay the warning went off and the compressor just kicked on so i may not need to start the car but i will to keep battery good let's go see Fingers crossed. Side. I hear no air leaking. Oh yeah. Sweet. Sweet. Alright, so the any scan uh, actually read all the modules. We got uh, 19 modules total. I'm only gonna be concerned with the air suspension. So it looks like it'd be a ride control system. Diagnose, and we can do read trouble code. There you go, leak in a system. So it's had fault codes for those. So let's go ahead and erase them. We can 
ignition on engine off so let's turn the car off don't press the brake turn the key back on so the ignition is on and then we'll do yes yes okay now one thing we do in cars is turn the key off and wait about 15 seconds it's supposed to allow control modules to accept what happened or power down or they have different terms for it but uh sometimes if you don't wait the right amount of time it doesn't register erasing the code so now we'll try again to read the code Except erasing the code so I'll try my odds and figure it out from there but for the most part uh, we got the Bentley figured out <clears throat> put the air shut in there all you do is take it for a ride to make sure it's good um, so they're not that uh, they're not that hard to do torqued everything down 30 newton meters 40 newton meters uh, make sure everything was set you always want to make sure there's no noise when you drive because uh, sometimes a reman strut this is supposed to be a new strut but sometimes a reman strut can make noise um if the strut if the if the shock element inside the strut was bad and all they did was replace the bellows i'm not sure if they actually put these things through like a, a function test on a stand or anything like that but uh yeah so far so good all right so bentley first drive after the shock replaced Shock, re shock replacement, strut replacement, hoping for no noise. It's a 2015 Flying Spur with 11,000 miles on it. Didn't even have a chance to use the strut. This road my shop is on is typical Illinois road. I'm in Peoria, Illinois. For those of you that are local and or know me, I guess you all know me now, right? It is nice and quiet, minus the snow. Not sure what's down, it's 38 degrees outside and dropping. Well, I'm gonna go with success because all of these bumps so far, I don't know if you can hear the bumps in the video. So now all I gotta do is look for the actual operation of the air suspension system. So far the compressor raised it, the compressor is not noisy. I was able to raise the car, lower the car. It held air overnight. Uh, very happy with the purchase of the strut through O'Reilly's. Um, it was a Dorman product. They tried to source the r naught and the number was good, but they couldn't find any. Um, they were able to find a Dorman, which when it came in the box, it was an OEM. Audi slash Volkswagen slash Skoda part but uh, the Phaeton and the Bentley are the same so um, I hope I've done something in this video to help you in your adventures if you can please subscribe please hit the notification bell if a video or title does not catch your fancy I promise you I will try to have all kinds of tips and tricks of my experience in each video. So there's going to be something you can take away for all cars. Um, one thing that I try to get people to understand is that no matter how much you pay for a car, a car is a car. They all function very, very similar, whether they have one part to do the function or 14 parts to perform the function. So when I do my videos, I will try to encompass as many models that I can within the issue that we're dealing with. So with this air strut, um, I wasn't too scared about tackling it because dealing with all the Mercedes air struts over the years uh, and just knowing how air suspension systems generally function gives me a great heads up as to how this one would function. Plus it was a mechanical failure. It was a straight leak. You can hear the leak. 
those kinds don't really require much brain power. So I don't want to make it seem like, you know, it was a huge to do, but the trick is that we don't know how long it's been leaking for. So the compressor can keep running and running and running to try to fill that strut, therefore making the compressor fail prematurely. Um, and or the valve block from constantly opening and closing, you know, you never know what can happen, but uh, so far so good, no complaints with this. Um, I did have error codes that would not be erased or could not be erased. I was able to erase them after I went through the active test. The active test functioned everything in the system. And since everything seemed to function and then it allowed me to erase the codes, whether that's how the factory scanner works or not, I'm not sure, but that's how it worked this time. So I was able to erase the codes and now there's no more fault codes in the system, so. This is my video on the 2015 Bentley Continental Flying Spur uh, front right air shock. I hope you guys enjoyed. Be safe. Talk to you next time.